Rebby, Rebby, I know you're stressed right now, but for the video, how are you? How are you doing right now? How are you? Uh, how are you enjoying the airport? You ready for the Poland trip? This is gonna be awesome. We're gonna be in the airport, I think, for another seven days, and then uh, hopefully, get guys will have to test again, get you home in time. Oh, 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 to a plane. How many have you done that before? It's a small, small town. Again, we're about an hour away from Lublin. And um, it, there's a house here in the town that they say is where the Rebbe lived. Uh, it's not really confirmed, but this is where he was buried. This is something that was built post the war. The, the cemetery was destroyed. It's not clear who destroyed it, whether the Nazis or the local people here. Um, you see also trees that, that were damaged as well, but uh, after the after the war, um, after sort of in the, in the 1980s, they <coughs> from tradition they knew exactly where the Kutzker, where his his cover was, and then they redid this. They made new a um, uh, new like it's not an ohel, but it's something covering where he's buried underneath. You can't go inside, but this this is what they had. It's him. And uh, the son here, he had a son who was David. Um, some of you guys may know Rabbi Johnson Morgenstern. Maybe you know his kid who's in, who's in Rachel now, no? Aiden. Aiden. So Rabbi Johnson Morgenstern and is uh, Ben Acher Ben. His, 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 his email is Kutzker Truth. He's Ben Acher Ben from the Kutzker. Um, his last name is Morgenstern, as was the Kutzker. I think he's uh, eighth generation, Ben Acher Ben from the Kutzker. When I was, uh, when I taught in Rishi once upon a time, 20 plus years ago, I think it was the first year I taught in Rishi, or the second year I taught in Rishi, so John Williamson was a student in Rishi. And I remember one time he told us that he went down to the Kotel, he, he woke up late, shot this morning, went down to catch uh, like one of the later minyan or the Kotel. It was like a Kalazak, Tevra, Minion, and uh, whatever, after the Minion, they, they, they come to 
Guy comes over to me and says, what's your name? He says, John Morgenson. He goes, not from the Kutzker Morgenson. He says, yeah, actually, uh, Ben Akhaben. That was an 18-year-old basic kid. Ben Akhaben. So uh, the guy says, no way. He goes, here, give me a bracha. Give me a bracha. <laughs> and then the whole line forms of all these guys from his minions waiting for John Morgenson to give him a bracha. He's an 18-year-old. Now he's a, a, a rabbi officer. Then he's an 18-year-old kid. And he's like, uh, have a good job. Wow. Next, have a good job. Anyway, so that, that understands, just to give you an understanding of what we're talking about. Like, the, the, so the Kutzker, the Kutzker, you understand, the Kutzker is a cross line. The, the Briskarov, Briskarov, who you would imagine, if you, if you understand the dynamics between the Litvisha world and the Hasidic world, the, the Briskarov is like the farthest thing you get from the from Hasidic. But the Briskarov would quote the Kutzker all the time. He loves the Kutzker. Because the Kutzker is about Emmet. There's one Midah that that you the, that stands out and it's just the Kutz, it's Emmet. And if there's one Rebbe, you would say, who's the Rebbe that most represents Emmet? Of course everyone else talk, represents truth. But you talk about Emmet, Hands down, you would say cut. Cut is MS. Now everyone else is MS, but the cut it was 100 percent. There's no, not even one, any any half percent, third of a one percent of non-truth. And it's, it's it's almost worthless in the eyes of the cut. That's why I, honestly, when I'm here, I'm I, I'm uh, I'm a little frightened. I'm frightened to speak because he knows I'm full of it. He knows I'm full of it. I cut his breath also knows. But we don't think about it that way all the time. But when you're like in the presence of the Kutzker, you feel a little bit more creepy that way, but it's just opposite of what he would say. But see that as may. We'll we'll start with this. Um Kutzker says as follows. Listen to this. I want to hear what you guys think about this. Kutzker says as follows. If you daven this morning, <clears throat> just because you daven yesterday, a Russia is greater than you. If you daven today, just because you daven yesterday, a Russia is greater than you. when you come into my tonic. Three difficulties here. Not Shailog. You have a lot of questions. Shailog, looking for information, a lot of questions. I'm sure you all have, and we'll try to address them. But three questions in order, you have to ask these questions, and, and, and the answer will be able to understand what this place is about. Who wants to take a stab at it? What are the difficulties here, Zach? Okay, excellent. What's it doing in the middle of the city of Lublin? And that's the question I wasn't sure you're going to pick up on because when, when we go to Treblinka tomorrow, we'll be in Belzic. 
Um, there's also Sobibor, which is about an hour, hour east of here. Um, those camps, those death camps were built in the middle of nowhere. An isolated area, very rural. You don't really see any kind of city for, for anywhere close to it. And here you have a Maidanic. When, when we walk, there's a, there's a lot of walking to do. Um, when, we, when we walk towards the crematorium, which is at the, all the way at the other end of this, of this camp, you'll be able to see the city um, looking towards your right. If you're living in the city of Lublin, you can, you can, you can see into Maidanic. What are you doing in the middle of the city? Okay, well, we'll answer the question in a second. We're at, first, we're just in, this, in the, in the, in the Kushia stage. Okay, very good. What else? What else is difficult here? And this one is also hard because you didn't see, you didn't get, you didn't get the six from anything else before this. Okay. Size? Size? It's comparative, but at least whatever is on top. It is, it is very large. Yeah. But it's not necessarily a kushia, you know, but it's... Yeah, what else? Okay, excellent. We would expect that there's going to be train tracks running into here. We've all seen the pictures of the Auschwitz working out, right? The train tracks running in. In, in Treblinka, Belgium, Sobibor, train tracks running basically right into the camp, alongside the camp. There's no train tracks here. The closest train is uh, seven kilometers from here. Okay. One more Kushia, which is again, again we won't have, have any other perspective, but great. What about what? So this one's a little harder again because we don't have a. Uh, it's why is it still standing? Why is it still here? All the other camps. The ones I mentioned earlier, Belzish, Silverboard, Treblinka, they were destroyed. They were, all the evidence was was uh, destroyed, we tried to hide, hide it. And here Maidanik is, is basically, a lot of it's been destroyed, but basically somewhat intact. Um, we're going to walk, you're going to see gas chambers, you're going to see crematorium, you're going to see barracks. There are people who say that uh, that uh, this place can get up and running in 36 hours. I personally uh, am not of that opinion. I'm more like a 37-hour guy. But um, and, and by the way, they did renovations here just recently. They're uh, just which 20, I think 2019. They closed off. They couldn't go into this building, which is where where the gas chambers are. And it took them two years. The Polish people here it took two years till they renovated it. So, had the Poles been running things, we would have had more people probably. But the Germans were more efficient. Um, the um, anyways, it's still standing. It's still standing. The question is, why is it still standing? Why didn't they destroy it? Now, a lot of it is destroyed. And a lot of it is destroyed, but not not by the Nazis. It was actually destroyed by when they, when it got liberated um, by Russians. So they were people suffered here terribly, and they just they wanted to destroy this, this place that they suffered terribly. And then they stopped, and they realized that um, it'd be much better off if we preserve it to show the people's compassion. Guys, ask me what that monument is over there. But um, the the, the, uh, the Russians they turned this they turned Maidanic they turned Maidanic into uh, a, a, one of the a, a, a museum and they built and they built that, that monument over there. There's another monument at, at the back. We're going to see um, where, the, where the ashes are. To again, and this this became a place to show the evils of fascism. But Nazism brought, brought to the world fascism by the communists are the opposite. They, 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 you know, part of the battle terminology was that, that uh, Hitler saw the Bolsheviks, which was what led to communism as like the... Basically here, Lublin, 
far from the Russian border, very far from the Russian border, about five miles. Um, <laughs> anyways, we're, we're over here in Lublin, okay? So close to Ukraine. That's the Ukraine, right, which is part of Russia, okay? Russia controls basically Ukraine, oh. Belarus, okay? So we're, we're, we're basically over here. So again, June 41 is when the, they, they invade and then they open this camp, Majdanek, alongside Lublin, over here, July 41. What was the original intention of this camp? No. War criminals. Not war criminals, but... Prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. POW camp. Okay? This original intention was to be a POW camp. You open a POW camp next to Lublin, next to the city, that's normal. That's, that's, that's standard. In, okay, because it's part of the eastern border. It was meant, and the truth is, is that here housed um, ha at least half of the prisoners of this camp were Russian POWs. Okay, they were also Polish political prisoners, and about the other half were Jews. But this wasn't opened as a death camp for Jews. That wasn't the original intention of, of Maidan. We're going to talk about tomorrow, we're going to talk about the death camps called Operation Reinhardt, which is, which is Treblinka, which is what we mentioned yesterday, um, uh, Sobibor, which is close to Lublin, and then Belzic, where we're going tomorrow, which is south, southeast of here. Those were death camps only for Jews. Maidanic was not built ju just for Jews. It becomes, as the war evolves, it becomes a place where Jews are sent. <coughs> Many of the Jews that were sent here which were, were sent from the Warsaw Ghetto. What we were watching the movie The Uprising, or some of you were watching the movie The Uprising, I wanted to show, actually show the pianist who wasn't working on, on the, had the wrong region, whatever it is, so we showed The Uprising, which is also a very important film. Um, a lot of the Jews that arrive here come here in April, May of 1943, coming from the Warsaw Ghetto during the uprising, the sent here to this area. Now, Maidanik is very important because the Operation Reinhardt becomes, because the central command center of the Operation Reinhardt camp is actually here. They open in. Bodies in the way. It would have been impossible to get in because the bodies would have been pressed up against the door, and it would be impossible to open the door. They say in like. I felt I was a witness to disaster and charged with the sacred mission of carrying the ghetto's history. It came from the Warsaw Ghetto through the flames and barbed wire until such time as I could hurl it into the face of the world. It seemed to me that this sense of mission would give me the strength to endure anything. But I was underestimating my dominant. Hell has no bottom. During the first days there, I felt so many blows upon my head that I was completely crushed. We were marched and, and ran from one end of the field to the other, from kitchen to fountain to, and back. 
near the fountain, the lager Eltista was amusing himself with his daily victim. He wore a green triangle, indicating that he was a common criminal. Often at random, he would grab someone and throw them into the pool, and whenever the man's head came up for air, he would club it or kick it back under the surface. The convulsing floundering of the drowning man filled him with ineffable joy, and he invited SS men, or even other inmates who happened to by, to share in his delight. The fun often ended tragically. The victim either died on the spot or emerged so weakened from the ordeal that he contracted pneumonia and died in a few days anyway. Always near the Lager Eltista was a 14-year-old Jewish boy called Bubi. In velvet shorts and, and military boots, he wandered around field three with his little riding crop, and even Jacob, the most hardened barrack elder, and the Terra Maidanic looked at Bubi with horror. In a moment of confidence, our own barrack elder told me the boy's story. Bubi had been sent to Maidanic from Lublin with his parents in the resettlement of autumn 1942. The Lager Eltista had liked his childish face and chosen him as a minion. Among the German inmates who were the Maidanic elite, some of them had been in camp since 1933. Homosexuality was widespread and they often picked boys from among the deportees. After Bubi had been so selected by the Lager Eltista, the boy had been knighted oh, and raised to the end of the
bit of nausea and came to a stop, but my guide kept urging me and, and hustling me along. In this way, we crossed the entire camp and finally stopped about 20 yards from the gate, which opened on the passage leading to the train. It was a comparatively uncrowded spot. I felt immeasurably relieved. <laughs> on the wall it says you are and 
It's such a powerful <laughs> pasuk. The pasuk right, says, Earth, do not cover my blood. Let there be no resting place for my outcry. So we composed, uh, this nigan came down, and I'd love to teach it, and if you can all... Joseph Orbach, my grandfather, is the middle son born to Naftali and Gitla Orbach. He and his parents, along with his older brother Marcus, 
and younger brother Sydney together survived the horrors of the Holocaust through a very, a very tough route. July was when they took out the, the 7th of July of, of Yuli, July um, is when the, 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 the first transport of Jews from Jezza, from Raisha to Belzish. Okay? And every year Mirak organizes a march of local people to, to march from the town square to the, where the train station was in, in memorial of the Jewish community that is no longer. Now, in, 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 in Jezreel, they call him the Jew. They call him the Jew. He's, he's, he's been subject to anti-Semitism. And, and it's just a small group of people that do this. And, they, and he is someone who wants to preserve the memory of, 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 of the people who are a very significant part of Polish history. And it's important to him despite the fact that he pays the price for it. Despite the fact that it's uncomfortable. It's not Noah to be known as a Jew in Poland when you're not a Jew. But he does it because it's tov. He does it because it's, it's correct and right and good. And Mirik is one of the good guys. So we want to thank Mirik. Check it, check it. Check this out, fellas.
with children. During those times, they closed off the road entering into the village. My mother ran to buy bread and when she returned, she said she saw a truck full of children being emptied. And the, Germans, and the Germans made the children run into the forest. The children were between, were between two and 10 years old. The ones who did not run, fa run fast enough were shot here on the road. I was a curious child. And in order to see what was going on, I snuck close to the fence, but made sure not to be seen so the Germans wouldn't see me. Sometimes a truck would come and pour out babies by raising the rear container. It would back up close to the pit, raise the container, and the babies simply spilled into the pit. <coughs> you could hear screaming. Sometimes I shot them here on the spot and then dragged them into the forest. Sometimes they shot them in the pit. This I, of course, did not see. I just heard the shots from the forest. After the shooting, when the Germans left, we snuck into the forest near the pits and we saw two giant pits. One over there, one over here. We're gonna go stand there in a minute. How do you go from seeing mass children graves, gas chambers, and concentration camps to Shabbos? Shabbos is a time of joy and happiness. What the group saw this week was anything but that. Shabbos began with a beautiful davening with passionate singing and dancing led by Yosef Fleischmann. The group then walked a few minutes and sat down to a delicious meal with powerful smells. We heard different Torah from Rev Stamen and then headed back to the hotel for a tish. With song led by Rev Elie Skaist, we poured our hearts out. Many of the guys spoke 
we heard about Noah Ripstein's great uncle, Manny, who exemplified the highest level of courage in the war and was able to kill many Nazis. We heard from Effie Freinich, who shared the very Torah he heard from his great-grandfather who survived the war. On Shabbos morning, we walked together to Shul. Davening was a mix between three different yeshivas with a magnificent display of Achos. We all came together and danced and sang to Hashem. How nice that it was Rosh Chodesh and hundreds of yeshiva students were able to sing Hal together in the very place our enemies tried to wipe us out. After Filo, we walked to Kiddush. Then we went on a walking tour led by Revulsion, taking us around the Jewish quarter in Krakow. We visited the Ramaz Shul and spoke about what the Holocaust was like for, pe- for the people living in Krakow. Lunch was another great meal. We had an enthusiastic Zmiros and Divri Torah from Ben Hav. We headed back to the hotel to enjoy a nice Shabbos afternoon. Some went on walks, others learned to nap. We then daven mincha and had shalshes. We made a big circle with our chairs and sang and shared stories. We were from Sam Kaufman and Natan Azubiri. We daven marv then hopped on the bus to head out to where the ghetto once was. We gathered around to hear musical Havdalo from Ravelli Skist. We danced and chanted, Six more days till Shabbos. Next, we had a barbecue malava malka and another rocking tish. As you can see, we spent much of Shabbos singing and dancing. This is the answer to the original question. How can we have a Shabbos after seeing the utter darkness and terror that was the Holocaust? There is only one answer. We have to sing, dance, and smile our way through Shabbos. When we walk the streets of Poland, singing where millions of our ancestors were murdered, we show that the Jewish people are eternal, and while we may take a hit, we will always come out the other side stronger. May we never have to know times like our ancestors did, and may we always keep singing, dancing, and persevering.
Understand, guys, understand that not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine, not ten, not, not eleven, not twelve, not thirteen, not fourteen, not fifteen, not sixteen. Not sixteen of your friends would not be here if not for a miracle that happened to their great grandparents. Mamish, we would not be the same. None of us would be the same without these sixteen guys. So the bracha is like this. Bracha ta Hashem alkenu mefalam. Okay. Shaasa neis laavosai from Akom Azet. That he made a miracle for my parents. Includes your grandparents, great grandparents, my my forefathers, my those who came before me in this place. Okay. Shaasa neis laavosai from Akom Azet. Okay. You're gonna, we'll say it together, and everyone else is gonna gonna answer Amen. 
grandmother was born um, actually in Europe and when they moved to Detroit um, she had one picture of two girls that she never knew she didn't know who they were but they were just in the house and she would always ask her ask her father who were they and he would never say anything he wouldn't say with their names he wouldn't say their significance he would just say it's an important picture um, after my great-grandfather passed away I was named after him and so was my my aunt and my cousin. They were named they were named um, Hana and Chaya. Um, that was their middle names. It happened to be a few years ago. Um, my grandmother's cousin did research into into the family tree to find out who these two girls were, and they realized that it's my grandmother's two half sisters, and they were named Chaya and Hana. And so without knowing anything, without knowing their names, my aunt and my cousin's middle names are the, are the names of my grandmother's two half-sisters that she never met. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 